Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. We are here inside of the Heritage Hill Studios, and you know that Heritage Hill, our exclusive studio partner, is out at the Brew House on 3149 Sweet Road in Pompey, New York, in the country of upstate New York. And in the city, you'll find them at Heritage Hill North on 628 South Main Street, North Syracuse. As always, for over a decade now, before this conference had a logo or a name, Wake Up Call has covered the American Athletic Conference. It's been very near and dear to me, and I am picture in picture with East Carolina Pirates head football coach Mike Houston, speaking with him since he came into the American and into East Carolina, and it's always good to have some time with him here. So, Coach, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. And I got I got to ask you this. I want to Tarantino and go backwards. What was it about East Carolina – that attracted you when you had the opportunity to become a head coach? Well, I just, uh, I, th- I think there's several things, but, you know, probably the biggest singular thing is just, it's, it's a football place. Uh, you know, growing up in the state of North Carolina, uh, you know, I knew about East Carolina football then. Uh, and then, you know, when, when we had a chance to come down here and play in 2017, when I was at James Madison uh, and just seeing the game day environment and just the commitment here uh, to support football, uh, you know, you want to go somewhere where, you know, this, this is what you do, it's what you love. You want to go somewhere where it's important. And uh, certainly football is important here. Yeah, and, and you talk about football being important to, to East Carolina. What kind of showed you that? What was it about the campus, about the overall culture and the feel that gave you that belief that there was such an emphasis on the Pirates football program? Well, you just, you know, we have a, a great stadium, okay, there's lots of places that have great stadiums. Uh, the fans are committed to the program here. They show up. I mean, it's, is, you know, I, I tell all of our recruits, you know, uh, our players appreciate the game day environment we have because when we go and play on the road, seldom is there anything close to what we experience here at home as far as fan support. Yeah. And so I think that uh, it's, it's just, it's, and it's not just the alumni, it's this region you know, this is, this region loves pirate football. And uh, that was evident from, uh, you know, our, our trip down here uh, at JMU. Uh, it was evident at my introductory press conference. And, you know, it's been, you know, one of the highlights of being here for five plus years is just the, the fans and their passion about our program. Yeah, and, you, you know, you're talking about the stadium, Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. I mean, you see pictures of it and it just screams – football it screams history it looks incredible especially with a nighttime sky what's it like to to practice on that field to to walk on to that field pre-game just to physically be in Dowdy Ficklin Stadium how would you describe it well it's you know since we've done the renovation my first year to the home side and have the new tower and uh it's a very impressive looking facility and so when when you take the field on game day, I mean, it, it screams a big time stage uh, and it's, it's got the, all the feels of it. And, you know, most people would tell you that we have kind of an SEC type environment, uh, the combination of the stadium, the stage and, you know, the fans that fill it. Uh, you know, we have a, a tremendous support from our, our students, uh, have a great student section here and, it just it has all the feels of a, of a just a great stage every time out. And we look at in your time there, you set an attendance record at Dowdy Ficklin Stadium, fifty one thousand seven hundred and eleven on September third, twenty twenty two, in the game against NC State inside of you know the state of North Carolina and that out of conference rivalry that you have back and forth. Just bring me into to that the fact that not only are you saying the fans show up, but within the last couple of years here, we saw a new attendance record of over 50,000. Well, I think, you know, our fans, like I said, they show up, they're passionate. Uh, that game was electric. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great rivalry between the two institutions. There's a lot of history uh, dating all the way back to the Peach Bowl in, in 92. Um, and, you know, there's respect uh, between the institutions and, and between Coach Dorn and I, uh, but it is a heated rivalry. And I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that we, you know, we have a contract that's going to allow us to continue playing each other for, you know, the next probably 10 years or so, you know, we're going to play every three years home and away. Uh, and so, you know, anytime we get, you know, a team like that coming into Dowdy Ficklin, 
uh, I think that just you know bumps the bumps the level up a little bit with what uh, you know how passionate our fans are about about a game a game like that. Absolutely, here with Mike Houston, the head coach of the East Carolina Pirates football program here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora and our coverage of the American Athletic Conference and college football in general inside of the Heritage Hill Studios. We have uh, games coming up this season. I'd love to go a little bit deeper into what this means. We have the Paint It Purple game against Appalachian State on September 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern time on a Saturday at home. And we have a Paint It Gold game, which is happening against uh, UTSA on Saturday, September 28th. Just bring us into the Paint It Gold and the Paint It Purple game. Well, it's, you know, just an opportunity for our, our fans to, you know, really just embrace uh, kind of the school spirit, uh, you know, the purple and gold are uh, the colors we wear. And so having a, you know, game dedicated to each. And, and I think that, especially look at those two games. I mean, Appalachian State, obviously, have a tremendous uh, football tradition there also. Uh, you know, Co- Coach and I know each other very well. And, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a great game up there last year in Boone. Uh, I expect that to be sold out. I mean, we it wouldn't shock me if we break the the, the attendance record again in that game uh, because I think that's a game that's that's becoming uh, much like NC State uh, another great in-state rivalry game. Uh, and so uh, that'll be a that'll be a, a real enjoyable one, a great a great environment. And then you know UTSA, uh, you know obviously uh, was the best you know program coming into our league from the from Conference USA, and uh, you know had a had a, a great year last year. Um, you know, it's uh, they're going to be one of the top teams in our league again this year. It's our conference opener, uh, so that's another game that's going to have you know a lot a lot of stuff around it. A very important uh, matchup for us. And, and we know with the schedule and also the paint it black game. Speaking on this uh, against FAU, which will be on Thursday night at eight p.m. Eastern time at home on November seventh. We know that there's this new rotation in order to get to the teams that are in the American Athletic Conference. There were 14 in, in football, which was the most ever, and there's still going to be 14 with SMU going out and Army coming in. So we know that there is a, a schedule set up over these next few years to kind of take a look, engage this, and to continue not having divisions. So we see those games this season against UTSA, Charlotte, Army in the conference now, Temple, FAU, Tulsa, North Texas, and Navy – and to create some of these rivalries within the conference as you have this rotation where every four years you'll get to play each team home and away. So we're going to have the conference actually see the conference, but knowing that East Carolina and Charlotte are going to be consistent, just what that, you know, in your opinion, does for the state of North Carolina, having that rivalry with NC State and now in conference as we look at this new scheduling format moving forward, knowing that that East Carolina Charlotte game is going to be something that people can circle and get used to. Well, I think you look at when I first came into the conference and, you know, people would ask you who, who, who are your rivals? Uh, and I don't know if there was one in conference, yeah. you know, I think, you know, you know maybe, maybe we created a little bit of one with Cincinnati. Maybe we created a little bit of one with UCF. They're both gone. Um, so, you know, NC State is what most people would tell you is our biggest rival, and that's an out-of-conference game. Yeah. So I think, you know, just being able to play Charlotte uh, year in, year out, uh, close proximity, you know, we recruit against each other a good bit. Um, I think that's going to truly create a rival for both of us in the league. Uh, and I think that's good for, um, you know, good for the league. I think it's good for both institutions. Uh, I think it's good for the state of North Carolina. Yeah, and and when you look at the rest of the schedule, the model for the American moving forward, what do you like about it? And and like I said, you know, having the home and home where you know that you're going to have the opportunity to consistently get to see if somebody stays four or five years in college, they're going to be able to see a team at least twice, on, once on the road, once at home. So we know that there's actually going to be a model put together where you're not looking at it saying, okay, we haven't played this team in five years in the conference. So knowing that there's going to be some continuity and that if you get your degree in school, you're going to be able to have that home and home. What does that do for the conference? And what does it do overall for a school like East Carolina to have a setup where, you know, there's going to be consistency? Well, I think one, it gives us, you know, kind of keeps the kind of competitive juices fresh, 
uh, between all the institutions. Um, you know, it allows you to go and see different places. Uh, you know, I think that's that's one of the, you know, the great things about college football and the opportunities it gives uh, young men is, you know, some of these guys, they've never been on a plane before. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first road trip, maybe their first plane flight. And, you know, to be able to go and travel and see different schools and play in different stadiums and, you know, you're creating a lot of memories uh, for players and, and some of the families that travel. And uh, so I, th- I think it's great. I mean, I, I like I like having a, a bigger conference with a variety of teams. And, you know, we are spread out. Uh, you know, it is we, we do have some pretty long trips, uh, but it gives you a chance to go, you know, play in San Antonio, play in Dallas, uh, you know, play different places. Yeah. And I know that for you, I mean, you've had a few years here at East Carolina. And when we look at that, Mike, and look at your history here, as we step forward into this upcoming schedule that we've spoken about, I also want to reflect back on when you came in in 2019, a team that went four and eight and then three and six that improved after that COVID year to seven and five, eight and five, obviously, you know, some struggle last year at two and 10, but to have two winning seasons and have the Birmingham Bowl and a victory within the Birmingham Bowl, as well as that, you know, Dowdy Ficklin Stadium, a new capacity record for a game with 51,711 back in September of 2022. What is happening here, in your opinion, over these last five years that maybe the record doesn't adequately show us of what you're building at East Carolina? Well, I think we have a very stable program right now. You know, it's uh, the culture's positive. Uh, anybody that's around you would tell you that. Uh, our roster has, has stayed fairly stable. Um, you know, mm-hmm. certainly last year was a tough year. And, uh, you know, we we lost, uh, you know, every starter off our offensive side of the ball uh, from 2022. And, you know, we didn't uh, we didn't play, you know, well enough on that side of the ball last year. But uh, I do think that's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of an anomaly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident this year that we're going, everything back is going to be back on track. Uh, excited about the roster we have. Excited about the schedule we have. So, um, you know, I think you know where we were when I got here in 2019 to where we are now. Uh, we have a very solid program. Uh, we have a lot that our fans are excited about. Uh, you know, I'm I'm passionate about East Carolina University. I'm, I'm I'm passionate about this program and 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 how it represents our institution. Uh, last year bothers me a lot. Uh, I've, I've probably never worked harder in the off season to, to fix the things that I, I knew needed to be fixed. And, but I think we've, you know, kind of flipped the script. Uh, you know, I think there's just a lot of positive enthusiasm right now uh, around the facility and around, uh, around Greenville. And uh, so, you know, August 31st can't get here fast enough for all of us. And you said that last season, the two and 10 season in 2023 bothered you a lot and you probably never worked harder. What are some of the things that you really honed in on addressing? I don't want to call it in the off season because I think any coach knows there's no true off season, but once 2023 ended, what were some of those pillars that you said, Hey, if, if we're going to build this thing and have that, like you said, you feel like there's stability in the football program at East Carolina, if last season bothered you and you've never worked harder, what were those things that you addressed to say, foundationally, we need to fix these cracks in order to be prepared and never go through this again? What were those right. cracks that you were fixing? Well, uh, we needed a new identity on offense. Uh, and we need, needed something that, um, you know, probably better uh, reflected kind of, you know, what I overall want to be uh, as, as a program. And, you know, I think defensively, and, and that's, you know, kind of more my background, I, I think that we, we, we have that true identity defensively. Um, you know, we really didn't have a true identity offensively. And so I knew I had to make some changes. Uh, you know, we brought in a new uh, offensive staff. Uh, John David Baker uh, is a bright young offensive coordinator, uh, very creative, uh, very innovative, very aggressive. Uh, you know, he's done a great job kind of, you know, rallying confidence uh, within our, our offensive players. Uh, we needed we needed to upgrade some personnel, uh, mainly at the quarterback position. Uh, so we brought in uh, two transfer quarterbacks uh, who have been uh, everything we could have wanted uh, and, and maybe just a, a touch better. Um added some playmakers at the wide receiver position to go along with some returning playmakers that we had that were young. 
Um, and so, you know, now I, I sit here and, you know, coming out of spring and in the middle of summer, uh, I feel like this is, you know, probably the most explosive offense that we've had in my time at East Carolina. Uh, and, and probably since I was at James Madison, uh, cause we were, we were fairly explosive there. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that along with what we have coming back defensively, um, I feel like we have a team that has a true identity on both sides of the football. Yeah, and you spoke about bringing in two transfer quarterbacks. What can you tell us about what you've seen from them both film-wise and then bringing them in, just what they showed you that made you believe, hey, if we're going to have to – if we're going to have this new identity on offense and we need to kind of ignite this offense, why these two guys – individually kind of speaking on their talents? Well, bo both of them obviously have elite talent. I mean, they were two of the highest, highest rated quarterbacks you know, in their respective classes coming out of high school. Uh, both of them have started games at the power five level. And, uh, you know, Caton obviously started most of the year last year at Michigan state. Uh, and then Jake started uh, a couple of games when he was at the university of Miami before he transferred to Missouri. Uh, so both of them have tremendous talent. Both of them have some experience and, you know, both have come in here uh, and, and really hungry. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I've had to kind of tamper down the, the competitive juices a couple of times, but, but they both want the job uh, yeah. and they both have meshed very well with coach Baker uh, and our receiving core uh, and nothing, you know, put that more on display than our spring game where at the, the first, you know, three or four drives were just, you know, big play after big play after big play and, you know, them making throws all over the field. So um, very pleased with, you know, how they both have been since they got here. Uh, and really it's, it's eventually somebody has to separate themselves and it's going to be whomever can, can make the offense operate the smoothest, the, the, the most efficient, uh, you know, produce the most positive big plays uh, you know, take care of the football, you know, that's, that's going to be the factors that we've got to use to kind of separate the two, you know, going into uh, the season. Yeah. And like you said, here with Mike Houston, the head coach of the East Carolina Pirates football program here on wake of call with Dan Tortora inside of the heritage heritage Hill studios, uh, Caton Hauser and, and Jake Garcia, as you mentioned them both transferring in and having, the opportunity to and rising to the level of starting some games each before coming to East Carolina, you said, you know, who, what, what it's going to take to separate, but do you like this? I mean, the fact that this is where we are, you got two guys that transferred in two new faces to the East Carolina program, but the fact that we're in the summer and when we head into the fall, they're still just scraping at every single bit to have the opportunity to do this as a head coach, is, is that the exciting part for you to say? Because some coaches are like, yeah, you know, I want to know the starter. I want to know who it is. But then other coaches are like, no, I, I like going down to the wire. I like seeing these guys duke it out. So from your seat as the head coach of East Carolina, knowing that Caton and Jake are going into the fall, still fighting for this thing, what does that do for this offense? And what does it do for the excitement from the seat of the head coach? Well, you know, the competition is going to make each of them better. Uh, you know, they are going to push uh, each other to, to, to bring out the best uh, in both of them. So that's what you like about the competition. Um, you know, do you hope that somebody uh, completely separates themselves? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I I'm glad there's not just one. I mean, I, I, if, you, if you only had one and there's this huge drop off, then, you know, you better take care of the one because if he goes down, you know, so does your season. And so I, I don't, I don't feel like that. I mean, I, I know that uh, if, if there were to be bumps and bruises or, or whatever, that you have somebody that's sitting there in the same room that can come in and there's no drop off at that position. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I like the fact that we have two solid guys. And you mentioned bringing in John David Baker to run your offense and to have that identity on offense and, and move into a new chapter, a more positive chapter. How would you describe what you're seeing? What can, what we can expect offensively from East Carolina through John David Baker and his tutelage? Well, uh, we're going to go fast and there's going to be a lot of fireworks. I mean, it's, if you watched Ole Miss uh, the past couple of years and particularly last year, 
Uh, you know, Coach Baker was the co-OC down there uh, the past several years. Uh, and he's brought, you know, kind of that same just aggressive, explosive, uh, you know, style. And, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, he, he's got some swagger to him. And I think that's that's rubbed off on the on the players. Um, I just think that I see a different kind of, I don't know what you want to use as a word for it, but just a, a different kind of moxie or, or attitude uh, with our offensive players. And it's, you know, the last several years kind of, you know, you, in spring practice and fall camp, you know, our defense has kind of had the had their way with the offense to a degree. I mean, it's, uh, you know, certainly, you know, we've had some bright spots on offense, but, you know, to, to have the offense come out there and, and, and get after the defense, you know, you know, several times throughout the spring, this spring, you know, it was, it was encouraging to see. And that's, that's where I expect fall camp to go. So I think, uh, you know, you have something that the fans are going to be excited about. Uh, I think they, they're, they're excited about this new style of offense our players are excited about it. They're confident in it, uh, and I think it's going to give us a chance to, you know, have a have a chance of a pretty special year. You know, and you spoke about <laughs> the defense having their way with the offense at times, and and the defense having more of an identity last year in 2023. And we go back to some of those games where you know they ended up being losses, but against Navy on the road, only allowing 10 points the defense uh, and then in the game against Tulane who was ranked in the top 25 at the time allowing 13 points and playing into that 13 to 10 loss and then against Charlotte only allowing 10 points so there were plenty of moments where the defense was condensing the game and providing opportunity and obviously you wanted more on the offensive side going into 2024 and understandably so but how would you assess the defense from last year into this year where are they excelling where are they getting better and what were some of those bright spots that you thought, hey, we didn't have the record I wanted, but these are the things that I really like to see out of our defense? Well, you know, they play the game the way I believe it's supposed to be played. And that's they're a tough, physical, hard-nosed bunch. Uh, and they will hit you. Uh, they, we are Nobody will ever accuse us of being a finesse team. You know, it's a very physical uh, group. And they're a veteran group. Uh, you know, our, our defensive linemen, most of those kids have been starting three or four years uh, in this league. And, uh, you know, they, they've been through the wars. And, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the secondary, in the linebacker room, you've got guys that have played a lot of snaps. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, Siobhan Ravel is one of the top corners in the country. I mean, I think, you know, he, he's going to be a guy that's going to become a household name this year. And so you have so many guys that are battle tested. Um, you know, I, I just I feel like this could be our best group we've had since I've been here. And when you look at putting a group together, obviously you look in the the high school world, right, and go through recruiting the traditional recruiting. But at the same time, you also have to look at the transfer portal, which we've addressed with bringing in some of those quarterbacks. What's the mix? How do you kind of address this as a program and as a head coach because it's I understand that and I saw your facial expression when I asked you what the mix was because some years it might be heavy high school other years it might be the portal but how do you kind of try to do the dance with this of getting what you need because of course somebody with experience and like you said playing in those power fives and whatnot there's there's something to be said to that and bringing that in there's also the talent that you can find those diamonds in the rough coming out of high school or coming from JUCO and whatnot. So how do you look to put the whole pot together, so to speak, knowing that college football has changed and there's a lot to be said, Mike, about the fact that we're living in a free agency world. Right. It's a tough question. I mean, I do think it's a mix. Um, you know, if, I, I do want to continue to try to build our foundation through high school recruiting because I think you bring kids in, you know, you really get to know them so well through the high school recruiting and, uh, you know, they come into a positive culture and, you know, you can grow them up the right way. Uh, now, I, I just, I hope we can still continue to operate like that because, you know, with you getting into more of kind of a free agency kind of mindset with college football, you know how how many how many places are going to have kids that stay four in five years? Yeah. Uh, you you hope you hope that they do. Uh, I, I don't want to lose that, but I think that we're in jeopardy of losing that. Uh, so 
you know, I think the mix is exactly what we did this past year. We were able to retain our top players and we were able to bring in the pieces that we needed to supplement our top returning players uh, to create this roster. And it was about probably 50, 50, as far as number of high school players versus transfers uh, in our signing class this year. But uh, I, th I think you're going to continue to see, you know, pretty, pretty steady turnover at every college football program in the country. I mean, and no, nobody's immune. Uh, you're at the university of Georgia and you've got, you know, arguably, you know, the, the best program in the country uh, and you see turnover uh, you see turnover to Ohio state. You, you see heavy turnover some places. So I just think it's, it's a mix and it's going to be different one year to the next. How do you create a culture of team over self when there's free agency, when there's NIL, how, how do you have the, the purity of what a team is supposed to be? I mean, like you said, when you're building something in East Carolina and you're bringing somebody in the frustration I can imagine you feel as a coach is if you find someone that Georgia didn't find and Florida didn't find and Michigan didn't find and, you know, North Carolina and so on and so forth. If the, if these schools didn't find this diamond in the rough and you found them and you polish it and you and your coaching staff do what you're supposed to do. And two years into doing everything you can with this diamond in the rough, they say, Hey, thanks for doing the recruiting for us. We're going to go get that guy in the portal. Now he's going to go to LSU. How, how do you build a culture where when you find the diamonds in the rough, you keep them and there's a love and a passion for the school itself for the unity in the locker room. Can you do that? Can we have purity of team in the current state of being for the quote unquote enterprise? Can we have the purity of finding a diamond in the rough and not essentially polishing it off for it to go to another team? I hope <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think that that, you know, we, we've tried to build, you know, we pride ourselves on recruiting character guys, guys yeah. that fit us, uh, that they have some substance to them, uh, that, you know, the morals and things that are important to them and their families are the same things that we believe in. We try to build a true family atmosphere around here, and, and we do that by, you know, trying to have genuine relationships with these kids and, you know, built on trust and honesty and uh, caring for each other. Uh, and, and that's what we've, we've created. I think that's the only reason we were able to hold on to our top players. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of attention given to, you know, the fact that Siobhan did not leave, even though, you know, he was recruited by uh, a lot of SEC schools and tampering galore. And uh, he chose to stay. And uh, I think that, you know, the only, the only way you keep a player like that is because of that, that culture and that, that environment and that, you know, the genuineness of the, of the way you've invested in them. Um, I hope we can hold on to that because I, I believe that's, that's the, the one piece you said purity. It's, it's, it's what I've always believed in about coaching and, and it's what I've believed in about, you know, college football. And, and I, I understand that the, the, it's a, there's a business side to it. I get all that stuff and, and I want our kids to benefit from NIL and we've worked very, very hard to, you know, help, help, you know, fundraise with the collective to support our student athletes. And I want to continue to, to do that. Uh, but I, I still, I, I don't want it to be just about the money. I mean, I want it to be about the right things. And uh, I, I hope we don't lose that. Yeah. You know, and as a head coach, I mean, you're recruiting, you're looking at film, you're traveling all over the place. You're trying to put together a game plan. You're trying to put together the right staff. You're trying not to micromanage and let people do what they need to do. You have to adjust. You have to be able to ad lib. And on top of all of that, you have to think about NIL. You have to think about the people that are around your student athletes that are maybe trying to pull them in different directions. You have to look at the transfer portal. You, We live in a world where they don't have to tell you they're going into the transfer portal. They just have to tell compliance. So you might walk in there, check out the transfer portal one day when you walk into your office and see some of your players in there. So with everything that's asked of a head coach, on top of now having NIL, the transfer portal, and all of these other things going on and the NCAA trying to figure out its identity,
Do they want to get Congress involved, this, that, and the third? Are they trying to directly pay players? How do you live in that environment, Mike? Because there was already more than enough asked of a head coach. And I think you could just ask any family of a head coach and they could tell you that. Now you have all these other pieces that you have to think about that came within these last five years or so. How do you manage that and still focus on the actual task, which is building good young men in society? Well, I think that's just it. You got to keep your, you got to keep your focus there. And uh, the other stuff that drives you nuts and it's not what you got into coaching for. And it's uh, it's, you spend too much time doing it, but you got to do it, you know, and it's, it's, it's part of it. And so you've got to adapt and you got to adjust, but you know, the highlight of my day, and I've told the players, it's the highlight of my day every day is the time I get to spend with them. You know, whether it's, you know, going in the weight room when they're in there working out or, you know, on the field or, you know, sitting in my office, talking to them, the, the highlight of my day each day are, are those young men. And uh, I think that's because of the type that we recruited here and the relationships we have. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to hold on to the, the core key values that, uh, that we have traditionally believed in. And uh, yeah, I've, 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 I've got to, you know, try to do a great job with NIL and do a great job with, you know, trying to find opportunities for our players and, and help them benefit, you know, from their name and image likeness. But uh, I also just, you know, want to keep, you know, the main thing, the main thing. And that's when they leave here, they have a degree and they're ready to go out and be a positive member of society. And a couple of things before I let you go here, here with Mike Houston, East Carolina Pirates head football coach. We look at leadership for the conference since the institution of the conference before there was a name and a logo, Mike Oresco was the commissioner after a decade plus, And I've been with him all the way through. So it's crazy to, I mean, you knew the day would come at some point, but at the same time, you know, I, the American synonymous of Mike, Mike with the American. Yeah. And when he made that decision to say, you know what, I'm in my early seventies, want to spend some time with my family, want to go to our retirement house, want to relax. What can you say about the legacy that Mike Oresco has left being the first commissioner of this conference and leading it through many times where it's had to rise through the ashes where he could have easily given up, packed up ship and said, we have three teams. We just lost these teams where you have to, I mean, the adjustment and realignment, I don't, I don't know outside of the American and maybe conference USA has had to deal more with constant change. How do you feel about him as a leader and just what he's done for the conference legacy wise? Well, I don't think anybody can deny the, the job he's done. Uh, you know, it, it's it's over the last 10 years, the American has easily been the outside of the power five, uh, the the most dominant conference, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, New Year's, uh, New Year's bowl games, uh, the college football playoff, uh, you know, what what Houston did, what Cincinnati did, what UCF did, uh, you know, SMU, I mean, you, you've had so many teams that just had these incredible runs, Memphis, um, and, you know, it's year in, year out, just the quality of this conference, you know, is, is the best in the non-Power Four or however many power conferences we're going to have. Um, you know, it's, that was Mike and his leadership. You know, he, he, he went out and championed to separate from the other, uh, you know, mid-major conferences, and, uh, he did a tremendous job and, uh, you know, I hate to see him go wish him the best in retirement, but, you know, he's left the conference very strong, uh, very stable. He's protected it. Uh, uh, and now you have a new leader coming in who's, you know, innovative and, and got all these, you know, new ideas of how to, you know, navigate the new college landscape and hopefully continue to build the brand that, uh, that Mike built uh, over the last you know, 10 plus years. And I was going to ask you that about Tim Pernetti, named the uh, second commissioner of the American Athletic. Just what your first impression has been of Tim and, and your thoughts about his leadership? Well, I mean, I haven't spent a ton of time with him yet. You know, we get to spend a lot of time uh, at the end of July with him. And uh, but, you know, everything we've heard is just 
he's kind of an outside the box thinker. Uh, he's he's not afraid of you know you know going different routes and new ideas and you know different ways to uh, enhance the conference. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, you know just where he takes us. Um, I think you know his background in marketing is probably going to benefit us in this new environment that we're in. And uh, you know I just I think that he's going to bring in maybe some just you know new fresh ideas. Before we get into rapid fire and have some fun with that, I gotta I gotta ask you, Mike, why do you love it? We've talked about the the tasks at hand, the the new things that get put onto the to do list that weren't there before with NIL and the transfer portal and whatnot. Why do you love it? Why come to work every single day? I'm happy that you do because I'm a fan, but why why keep doing this? Why keep coaching? You know, I'm the only member of my family to ever go to college. And if it wasn't for the sport of football, I probably wouldn't have went. But uh, the opportunity that a coach gave me, you know, 30 some years ago, uh, you know, changed the direction of my life and changed the direction of my family. And, uh, you know, everything I have today, you know, God's blessed me with and, and it's, it's come to me through the, through the game of football. And, you know, when I'm out on the grass, uh, and I'm I'm happy we still have natural grass in Daddy Ficklin Stadium. I'm gonna hold on to that as long as we can. Yeah. But when I'm out when I'm out on the grass with the players and you know you're you're in that environment and you know the you see you know guys you know develop and improve and and grow into their potential and then you know see them do it on game day. There's just there's no greater satisfaction for me than, than seeing players come together and, and do something together. And um, I love the game. I love all the aspects of it. I love the locker room. I love, you know, the, the team camaraderie piece. Uh, you know, it's just every part of, you know, what college football is. Uh, I just, it's in my fabric. It's, it's in me. And, you know, I've, I've got, I've got players that I'm very close with that, you know, played for me 10 years ago or five years ago or wherever, you know, seeing them uh, use this opportunity to, you know, do the same things with their family, their futures. Um, it's just, it's all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I, even though some of the new stuff is driving me nuts, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And uh, I don't know, you know, eventually, eventually I'll be done with it, but uh, I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. I like hearing that, and I, I want to just make a note. Who was that coach that gave you that opportunity? His name was Felton Stevens, uh, and he's he's passed away uh, a, a couple of years ago, but he was the head coach at Mars Hill University. And uh, Coach Tom Weaver, who's retired and still, still lives in that area, uh, Coach Weaver recruited me, and Coach Stevens uh, believed in me, and, uh, you know, they gave me that chance. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have had that opportunity. That coming here from Mike Houston inside of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora here in the Heritage Hill Studios. We're going to play rapid fire, Mike, which okay. means that you and I can put each other on the hot seat. All what right. We want to ask, and you know, as a coach, you never get to ask the question. So have at it today. What's your first one for me? Okay. What's uh, what's the best mini series you've seen lately? Good question. What's the best mini series I've seen lately? I'm trying to think of what I've watched. I've been watching a lot of movies, but I'd probably say, I'm trying to think now, the, well, I mean, I, I really loved watching Ted Lasso. Absolutely. I love the messages of Ted Lasso. Yeah. I feel like I live in that world of like wanting to give and get advice and at the same time make things fun and family oriented. But I would also say the one, and, and I'm forgetting the name of it. I'm actually gonna I'm I'm gonna look it up here while we're talking about it here. But the I'm trying to think of what it's on. It's on, I think it's on Amazon. Oh no, it's on Apple. And it's the Godzilla series that I thought was really good. It's uh Monarch Legacy of Monsters. That, okay. that that's a really interesting one. It jumps around a lot, it gets yeah. confusing, but I thought that was a pretty good series. My first question for you, Mike, hmm. if you could go into any TV show or movie universe, 
what TV show or movie would you want to live in and why? <laughs> uh, maybe the Avengers. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of enjoy the sci-fi stuff and the action movie stuff. And, uh, you know, it's always, uh, always, always a, a, a great movie. And, uh, uh, so yeah, I think that it keeps your, keeps your blood pumping. This is a one B to that. What character would you be? Iron Man. I mean, you got all the gadgets. I'm kind of a tech guy. So, uh, I think Tony Stark is, uh, definitely a gadget guy. So that, that, that'd be a lot of fun. The goatee is is very yeah, much in, you an, go. ode, an ode to Mr. Stark. What's your second question for me? Um, favorite uh, favorite music group or artist right now? Right now. Right now. You know what? I got to give credit to them. I don't really care what anybody says. I like what I like. I didn't know their music that well, and I never really listened to it, but it's been speaking to a lot of my emotion recently. And I would say I got to give credit to the Jonas Brothers for having some really like genuine lyrics about family and relationships and going through adversity and right. re remembering stuff, being positive, living in the moment. So I would say there's a bunch of their songs that kind of hit me now that I didn't even know about, I'd probably say. My question back to you, Mike, I'm all about... I'm all about the food because I love to cook. So I want to know if I came to the Houston household. Okay. What are you making? Like, I want a three course meal. What are you making in the house to show me that you know what you're doing when it comes to cooking? Well, I, the thing I'm going to make is I'm going to, I'm going to prepare for you the best filet that you're going to have in Greenville, North Carolina. Okay. I'm gonna do it on the green egg. I got a whole I got a whole procedure of how I do it. It's going to be crispy on the outside, you know, just really, you know, crispy crust. It's going to be medium rare on the inside, uh, probably on the rare side of medium rare. It's going to have tremendous flavor that uh, you're going to, you know, taste with each bite. Uh, now the rest of the meal, my wife's going to fix. So. <laughs> You don't want me fixing the rest of the meal. She's going to she's gonna have some kind of risotto. She's going to have, you know, a great Caesar salad. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll find a good bottle of wine to go with the steak. But uh, it'll be the it'll be the best steak you're going to have around this area. Yeah. Well, and now I just I want the invitation because now I'm hungry. So my, <laughs> my last one or the, your last question for me, Mike, what do you got? Well, I, I was thinking along the food line, too. Okay. But hey, what's your what's your favorite restaurant? Uh, in the area that you're in. Okay. So I'm by my hometown of, of Syracuse, New York, and obviously, you know, being back home, there's a lot of places that I like. There's a lot of food that a lot of different food, but I would probably say, I'm trying to think now what I've gotten recently. Cause there's certain places that I find myself going back to a lot. I love a good fig and pig pizza. And I feel like a lot of people don't know, like the, the fig that, that sweet fig and then having like prosciutto on it. And they do it really well down in St. Augustine and actually Bill Murray's family restaurant, the Caddyshack restaurant is great, but there's one here that they do at toss and fire that I never knew that they did. And I got it one day and then I got it the next day. And then I went back a few days later, and got it again. Cause it's like, it's, it's more of a, uh, it's a thin crust. It's not as big. It's kind of like personal size and whatnot. Okay. But I, there's just something about fig and pig that I love the dance between sweet and, uh, and savory. And, yeah. and I, like the, I like the fig flavor a lot. And I feel like I might start cooking with that a little bit more. So I'd probably say that's been a go-to recently. Can I have anything like that? You've, you've intrigued me. Yeah, that's no, it's good. It's very good. My qu my last question for you, Mike. Hmm. Okay, how about this? So you've seen me. We met in person. I would like to think that I take care of my body pretty well. I can always get better. I have more cardio than I used to do. I'll say that. I'm five foot eight. Uh, got a lot of passion. Big faith in God. 
if you put me on the East Carolina Pirates team right now, what position would you put me at? I think you're probably going to be a safety. You know, you got some you got some fire and energy in you. And so I think that's always good in the secondary. And, you know, a, a guy that's, uh, you know, maybe not the, the tallest of stature, you know, we can still play at that boundary safety as long as you'll fit the B-gap now. You got to, right. you got to come down. You got to come down and support the run, though. Yeah. Hey, that's that's fine. I, I will say this: if I if I was out, I mean, wherever I am, I'm giving 150. percent And if you told me wherever that guy goes, or where you know whoever's coming through, if they break through here and they're coming after you, and they, and that running back is coming at you, I don't need you to wait for him to get to you. I need you to get to him first. I would tell you without doubt, I'm gonna give everything I can. And I've met some good safeties in my day that have taught me a lot about putting it all out there. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that you, uh, you know, didn't put me as a water boy or something like that. So, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I didn't put you out there as uh, you know, the holder or anything like that. So, yeah, that's true. And and they don't get the respect that they deserve for sure. But right. Mike Houston here, East Carolina Pirates head football coach, as we head into the 2024, 25 season in coverage of East Carolina and, of course, uh, over a decade of covering the East Carolina Pirates here on Wake Up Call inside of Heritage Hill Studios. Mike, as always, I can't thank you enough for spending the time that you spend and, and always making yourself available. It is uh, truly an honor for me, and I'm not just saying that, to be, meet a man of faith, somebody who believes in the right things and trying to keep that teamwork and that family connection amidst everything going on and you know, just a, a good hearted person that always makes time. So I can't thank you enough for that. I, I appreciate that. Just, you know, appreciate the way you promote our program and the sport of football and uh, excited for 2024. So uh, I'm sure I'll see you probably here at the end of July uh, at media days. So uh, have a great, uh, have a great fourth until then. Absolutely. You as well.